hi everybody and welcome to another session in our women lead online forums brought to you by connected women of influence i'm patty vargas and and i'm your host today and today we are in the ladies room and you know the ladies room is that place where we kind of go when we want to talk about stuff and it's stuff that we talk about that may be we wouldn't necessarily talk about in front of everybody else, but we're able to do it there because, you know, we have shared experiences, we have shared heartaches, we have shared opinions, vent some frustrations, give advice to each other. And so basically we like to say that in the ladies room is one place where it's safe that we can all go there, right? So today's session lasts for about an hour. And if you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our panelists and our attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. Um, if there's something you want to contribute anonymously, just put it in the chat and I'd be happy to share it for you. I kind of have a feeling that maybe tonight's conversation isn't going to really lend itself to people having a, an opinion they want to keep under the covers. So our topic tonight in the ladies room is, is America ready for a female president? And I almost feel like we should say, dun, 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 after that, you know? <laughs> But, and I was talking to somebody about this and they said, well, what's the topic? And I told them, they said, oh no, I'm not going to go. No, no, no. I'm not going to join that. I don't want, no, I don't want to get into a political fight. And I said, well, it's not a political fight. We're going to talk about the reality of what in the world happened. How can you have so many women, you know, running for office and doing these fabulous things. And we start out with six women, you know, leading into the primaries and, we have what we have, you know, so what in the world is going on? So I, I looked around and I thought, okay, let me find me some ladies that have great opinions and they're not afraid to talk and they're not afraid to go there. So let me introduce you to our panel today. So first we have Linda Lotto. Linda is the COO at Igneo Consulting and she's the author of Let Go and Love What You Do, Finding Purpose, Meaning, and Joy in Your Work, and Changing Lanes, Work Strategies to Feel Connected, Fulfilled, and Energized Every Day. So Linda, wave at everybody so they know who you are. Next, we have Marcy Brow. She is the branding portrait photographer who helps entrepreneurs up-level their image by creating photos that are stunning, tell their story, and attract their ideal client. So Marcy, give everybody a wave. <laughs> Next, we have Susan Treadgold who is a holistic high performance coach and speaker and the founder of Treadgold Executive Development. Susan helps others identify their limiting beliefs and behaviors and provides tools and strategies to guide them so that they're able to show up as their best versions of themselves, both personally and professionally. So give us a wave, Susan. And then finally, last but not least, we have Adrian Grace, who is the owner, creative director, brand strategist, and all around smarty pants at Vim and Vigor Creative. And Adrian is a graphic designer and art director with extensive experience in retail and service industries. Adrian designs for print, web, editorial, and packaging. So go ahead and give a wave, Adrian. All right, hi all you beautiful ladies. Let's get this party started. So I'm just gonna ask the obvious, what the hell happened? <laughs> How did we end up with such great talent and we, we have an old wide dude you know, as the, the presidential candidate? What happened? <laughs> Not that I have anything against old white dudes, you know, but. Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I don't know what happened and it's definitely not for lack of my vote because I got that in early. <laughs> so I did vote for a woman and not because she was a woman and I felt some sort of sorority kinship. I voted for the person who I thought was the best candidate. Um, and, you know, I'm no political strategist. That's not my job, but I know that the field was very crowded. And I think when you don't have a clear message as a party, it's easy to get diluted. And it's just tricky. I, you know, we were saying this before the phone, um, excuse me, before this conference started, is that, you know, in an election, sometimes you think you know, you're sure what's going to happen, and then people surprise you. So I wish I knew what happened. And if anybody has any kind of armchair theory about that, I'd love to know. 
<laughs> well, I think there's an old adage in politics that men run to be somebody where women run to do something. And I think a lot of women that got into the race, especially in 2016, well, you know, 1992 was the year of the woman after the Clarence Thomas uh, debacle. Um, a lot of women came into to the Senate and to the House, and then, of course, in 2018 as well, because we wanted things to change. Women work well together. They try to solve problems. Um, I'm a working mom. I'm running for a local office. And I see problems. I see things that aren't working, and I want to fix them. Mm -hmm. And I think what happened right now is that women who have a plan, and Elizabeth Warren had a plan for everything, um, it's really hard to put that on a bumper sticker. It's hard to be policy oriented and explain to people how government works on, you know, 140 characters. Uh, and so people who are competent, but don't have the performance ability to be, you know, charismatic or be performance oriented or be able to, you know, come across as likable, which women have this double edged sword. We're not likable. We're too competent. We're too smart. We're too pretty. We're not pretty enough. It's exhausting. Uh, and Hillary Clinton said she spent 22 days putting on hair and makeup during her uh, run up to the presidency. 22 days hair and makeup. <laughs> wow. Wow. So it's a double standard. It's clearly a double standard for women. Yeah. Well, and, and I liked uh, when Elizabeth was interviewed after she dropped out, you know, and um, and I was I was really impressed listening to her say that she goes, if I say, you know, that this was sexist, I'm going to get beat up. If I say it wasn't, I'm going to get beat up, you mm -hmm. know, so just going to call it, you know, like it is. It is. It's going to be what it is. And, you know, it, it's interesting, Layla, that you said that about it's hard to put, I have a plan or something like that on a bumper sticker. I wonder if right now in the midst of, of what we're in the midst of and everybody desperately wanting a plan, desperately wanting to know that somebody has a roadmap out of this mess. I wonder if, if this had happened earlier, I'm trying to think of how to even word this, if, if the um, primaries had happened in the midst of all of this, what would it have looked like? You know, mm -hmm. if, if someone could have stood up and said, here's my seven step plan to get us out of this, man, would, would we have gone sign me up? I'm, I'm in, you know. That's interesting you say that because there's been a lot of press about how female leaders around the world. I mean, there's a lot of female leaders around the world. You know, most of Scandinavia, Iceland, Germany, New Zealand, you know, they all have female leaders and mm -hmm. they're being praised for how they've been handling this crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And you know, something I've noticed that is missing with our current leadership is a total lack of empathy. <laughs> and I was asking someone the other day, have you ever heard anything that resembles empathy? And, you know, and I think Susan, to your point, a lot of press that I've been seeing about these female leaders are it's around their style and how their how their leadership style is and it's and it's um I don't want to say mothering, but it ha it's oozing with empathy. And that's something I think that uh, we're missing, whether that comes in the form of a man or a woman, I just think that quality is missing. And I do think that women are more associated with empathy and emotion than men are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I w just on that point, I, you know, we we're talking about whether this happened all in the midst of it, because I've been canvassing, asking people are, are, you know, are we ready for a female president? And I had two or three people say to me, well, I thought we were, but not during COVID. Huh. Interesting, why, what was the, uh, like, what And they was the thought that people would revert. And this is the funny thing, all of these surveys say, well, I'm ready, but <laughs> it's not, or I'm ready. I think it's like asking for a friend, you know? <laughs> I, I'm wondering if, if people are really, are they really ready? Are they? saying, well, I am, but, you know, um, I don't know if, you know, everybody else is, or I'm more ready than they are, or whether they're kind of hedging their own opinion with this, because the three people I asked, I'm wondering whether it was really their own opinion that they'd have, they prefer a male at the helm right now, and revert back to paternalism and being protected with a fatherly figure, whether that's something that is subconsciously within them, hmm. Or if it really is, you know, 
yeah, that's what I'm asking myself. Hmm. Interesting. I read out some similar things to what you've just said, Susan, and um, I also thought it was really interesting, like, oh, I'm ready, but maybe not everybody else is, and we need, uh, so certainly on the Democratic side, oh, we need somebody that is able to beat Donald Trump, and well, I need to make my vote count, and I think that that's a really bizarre concept to me and that your vote counts and it should be placed where you think but there's i don't know something about being associated with uh, supporting the winner that i th think that that somehow is a validation or something that i was surprised but that was my intuition of what I, what I was reading was that there was this need to be associated and support the winner like that if you'd supported somebody else, maybe that was a mistake or that that wasn't supporting ultimately the leadership. So, sorry. No, Linda, go for it. A, a lot of the times people want to make sure that they are aligning themselves with the winner and, if, and they won't vote for somebody who they think doesn't really have a chance because they want to be in that winning um, category. Now, there are, you know, two different sides of that, of course, you know, the two different parties, but they do want to make sure that they're backing a winner, that somebody who can actually win versus someone who they might like better, but may not actually win. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I saw an interview with Marianne Williamson, and she was just saying the number of people that came up to her and said, oh my God, you have the best policies of anyone I know, but, you know, you're, you know. I, I, I've got to be, you know, give my vote to someone who can win type of thing, you know, so telling her that, you know, validating her all the time and saying, oh, you are, um, you are uh, making the discussion more interesting, but, but I wouldn't actually vote for you. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of people make the discussion interesting, you know, I mean, uh, Tulsi Gabbard made the discussion interesting, you know, did she not? But yeah. But I, I think of um, this whole idea of voting for the person that can win is until we get away from that, I don't know what, I honestly, I don't know what's, what's going to ever happen. It, when you're always thinking, well, I, I you know, 50% of the population thinks that, I don't know, let's, you know, pick a name out of a hat, you know, Amy Klobuchar is, is the most perfect person ever. You know, she's, she's has a lot of common sense and she's got a plan and she's from the middle of the country and she's all these kinds of things. So, you know, she's, she's absolutely the best candidate, but I'm not going to vote for her because I don't think she can beat Donald Trump or I don't think she can win the primary or, or whatever your excuse is. As long as we're locked into that, then you're always going to have what you've always had, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I voted for Elizabeth Warren in California in the primary. My husband voted for Pete Buttigieg. And we had a very interesting discussion <laughs> about that. Um, uh, so I, I think, you know, obviously there are barriers to entry in business for women in terms of credit worthiness and uh, ability to, to access capital, which is a huge, a huge barrier for women, especially um, women of color. Mm -hmm. I think that that goes for um, politics as well, to raise money to be competitive. I mean, unless we can pass, get rid of Citizens United and pass financial uh, reform in this country, that barrier of, of being able to raise money to show that you're viable. You know, I'm doing endorsements right now and people are like, well, how much have you raised? And are you viable? You know, my competitor is incumbent. He's got a lot of money. So how do you think you can win? So you're constantly having to prove yourself as being viable. And a lot of that comes down to finances. And we know that women don't have those networks, those circle, you know, those circles that we can call, you know, XYZ person and they can drop, you know, a $10,000 check to our, to our campaign. So I think with Elizabeth Warren, we were seeing her struggle with that to raise money in the last quarter compared to like Bernie Sanders, for example. And that really hurt her because again, it sends that signal to like what some of you were saying that she's just not as competitive because she can't raise the money. Um, and I think that is a real disservice. So, I mean, I think that's one of the issues, obviously in the 26th election, there was 
foreign influence on the election and, and, and social media bubbles that we're all in now that were influenced. But, but I wanted to make a point about women internalizing messages because I was shocked when I heard how many women voted against Hillary and voted for Donald Trump. You know, and I was like, how is that possible? I mean, here's the, the pussy grabber and all of this, you know, horrible attitude toward women, the three wives. I mean, we know he's a douchebag. And so how could they have voted for him? Um, and, and some people say, well, it was because of the courts and the, but, but how can you say that you're a woman, that you're a feminist, that you're a mom, that you care about the climate and the world and vote for this guy? That I couldn't figure out. I still don't understand today how women could have, women could have voted for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I'm sorry. I think uh, the majority of the women that did vote for him were the women who were like, women should not be in politics. Mm -hmm. there, there actually, there is a strong correlation between the two parties, which is probably not surprising, uh, between sexism and racism. Mm -hmm. and the, the belief systems. And of course, I think to Diana's point, you, you're right, there's a real draw there for those kinds of people that don't, that's threatening. Mm -hmm. And you can only, you know. Diana, say more about that. Well. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to hear what you say. It, it's, um, it's this thing where like, I've even pulled people on my Facebook and um, a lot of them are family members who are Christian, who are super into church and just talk about how amazing Jesus is. And then um, turn around and say, women should not be in politics. Like mm -hmm. it's not, it's not for women. Men should be in charge. And uh, a lot of them are also like, I just don't think a woman should be there. How, how do they justify his amoral behavior then? They don't. Mm. Okay. Now, do you, you know, think that people voted for Trump because th he was not Hillary? Is mm -hmm. that where is that what we're seeing? Just because he was the alternative to someone that got, let's be honest, very unfairly, um, you know, positioned and and bullied very unfairly even even when we know politics is not fair but i think a lot of a lot of women voted for him because he was not hillary and i think to your point diana i think a lot of people and this is um in what i've seen i don't know if it's a fact but i think a lot of people who are um christian and very religious don't want to vote for someone that is um potentially pro-abortion i think that Correct. That puts a lot of people in a certain camp and they won't even consider someone. It's almost like if we just took a portion off the table and then we can really get down to some issues, but some people are just so black and white that kills a lot of prospects. So you know, it's interesting because I, I shared with somebody um, just recently that it has been a very long time since I voted for somebody. Ah. And, and, uh, and I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, Amy was my candidate. I, I was so impressed with her and she, and the night that she dropped out, I was in San Francisco teaching a class and I just sat in my room and cried. I mean, you'd seen it coming, you knew it was coming, but I was just like, no, this can't, this can't be the end. They're all gone. You know, it just was, was just heartbreaking to me because she was my standard and it was, it was so it was the first time in many, many years I had voted for somebody instead of voting against mm -hmm. somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a whole lot, you know, it was interesting that you said, Marcy, that somebody voted for Donald Trump to vote against Hillary Clinton. And, and I was the opposite. I voted, I, I was never truly a Hillary fan. I was excited that we had a woman running for president and I was disappointed she was the best that they came up with, to be honest with you. Um, but I voted for her. You better believe I voted for her because I voted against him. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, so many dynamics that just came into just the last three minutes of conversation here of, you know, I vote for this candidate because they stand for this on the Supreme Court and they're going to make this happen. And, um, you know, when, like what, what of your what parts of your value system are you willing to compromise? Are you willing to say doesn't matter enough to stack the court?
for for one issue you know like so so let's say you want to stack the court with anti-abortion people great fine that's your goal and you're willing to sacrifice all these other beliefs that you have that are critical to who you are mm -hmm. and critical to your your entire belief system and critical to what you want people to say about you and what you how you want to raise your children because mm -hmm. i'm going to hone in on this one thing and i am going to face it you elected mitch mcconnell is what you did because <laughs> that guy is driving it to to the nth degree yeah yeah i should step off my soapbox <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what I'm what I'm wondering whether I just uh, saw the debrief of the women in the workplace done by uh, McKinsey. Yes, yes. And um, the one area that there had been a well, there were two takeaways that I had from it. One was that you know there had been a relatively large increase in women on boards in the past five years. Uh, that was up 24 percent. Um, so 44 percent of boards now have three or more women. Mm -hmm. And I, I think leadership at that level is a feeder to leadership at a higher level. Mm -hmm. So um, I was encouraged that I feel like we're stacking the pipeline in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but what hadn't changed was microaggressions against women in the past five years. Mm -hmm. and, and then I see all of the like dissecting of women. You know, I, I lived in London for 23 years. And, you know, even the dissecting of, you know, the former prime minister of the United Kingdom, everyone talks about what she wears, her hair, this, that. And, you know, like these subtle, you know, talking over women. Um, there's so many microaggressions that haven't changed. And, um, yeah, so I think that's one of the other things that needs to change. Yeah, I'm interested in your perspective, Susan, coming, you know, with having lived in London for so long. You know, I mean, the Iron Lady, seriously, you know, do, would, would we would we talk about the Iron Man? Like what? <laughs> that's such a good point. Yeah, it's like she's the exception. Yeah. 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 Interesting. I, I tuned in, I was on um, Instagram a couple of weeks ago and I saw that um, um, Elizabeth Warren was with AOC Cortez uh, from, from this, I, I forget if she's from Brooklyn, but I, don't, I think she's um, a Congresswoman, not a Senator. Um, and the two of them were having a discussion live and you can see the stream of comments um, and there was just stream after stream of these horrible trolls and they were just saying the most horrific things. I had to turn it off. I was interested in the conversation, but I was so distracted by the trolls and the comments and it was like, had nothing to do with the conversation they were having. They were really trying to push a beautiful agenda of helping people and their constituencies. And I was like this, it was all about appearance and them being Democrat baby killers. And it was, it was so distracting. And I, and I think that it's true. It's like, can we just stop talking about how people look or sound and really just get down to what their, you know, competencies are. <laughs> but that has a real agenda to it. Yes. Right. Because uh, something I read that I thought was so interesting um, was talking about how when they did some polling, uh, you know, and they were asking if this was for the 2016 election, would they vote for you know Donald Trump or would they vote for um, Hillary Clinton? And they went back and they did this twice and they asked, uh, particularly men, um, they would ask them just yes or no, who would they vote for? And it was, you know, fairly even. And then when they brought up whether or not women were starting to make gains in corporations, they were starting to earn as much, or sometimes maybe were the breadwinners, and that there's this change, there was a major shift towards Trump. Mm -hmm. It was like this, so just a few well-chosen sort of fires like this get people enraged and it really some of these people that's their whole goal is just to enrage people and make them fearful and reactive knowing that it will skew 
the results for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So a few really horrible voices. Um, it's really interesting. I just thought that was really sad. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes me think of, of that sort of reaction that they're looking for when you're talking about these horrible things that they're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, um, have, I have this dream. I have a dream <laughs> of no longer having a two-party system. And, you know, and I realize we actually have a five party system, but nobody ever votes for anybody outside of the two party. Right. And, you know, and it's never going to be. But, you know, just think about when we were in junior high and high school and you ran for office. You didn't run as a part of a party. You ran as an individual, you know, and I take that back in my in high school. We actually did have political parties. It was terrible. We had conventions. We had the whole nine yards. But so go back to junior high and, and elementary school and you wanted to run for student council. And you weren't part of a party, it was just you. And what did you want to do? And mm -hmm. you know, like, wouldn't it be amazing? Wouldn't it be amazing if we somehow got away from the two party system and it was just who's the best candidate? You know, and every once in a while when they've talked about mixing it up and having, you know, a Republican president and the vice pre or a Democratic vice president, you know, candidate, or mm -hmm. you know, the um what was it when um Joe Lieberman was the independent, and who's vice president candidate? Who was he vice president for? Stockton, I think. Wasn't it that General or, Stockton or somebody like that? Well, he didn't run for president. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, oh man. Anyway, that was exciting. It was like, okay, that's cool. Let's mix it up. Let's, you know, let's mix up the parties like that. But I, you know, I, I don't know what it's going to take, you know, to make yeah. that, to make that happen. I think one happen. thing is the mechanics. We have to get rid of the electoral college because if we don't have popular vote, and by the way, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. It was four states that determined the election. So, and that was less than 77,000 votes. So 70, 76 million people stayed home, to your point, didn't vote. So, and that was mostly younger people who were just, mm -hmm. I don't like any of them. Um, so there's engagement, but I think there's there's electoral reform. Obviously, we know there's voter suppression, especially in minority communities that happen. Um, so mail-in ballots, I mean, this pushback that you're seeing now that we don't want to have any mail-in ballot. Let's destroy the U.S. post office so we get rid of it before the election. I mean, it's very intentional. And, and, and there's, I think there's an ignorance, a general ignorance, ignorance in, in this country of what goes on behind the scenes, because a lot of it is structural. It's the gerrymandering, the redistricting, um, the voter suppression that happens um, so that you get a certain voting block to come out. And you'll vote if you feel very strongly against something or if you feel very strongly for something. Mm -hmm. And so they saw when they put legalization of marijuana on the ballot at the same time of the midterm or the general, young people came out, right? Mm -hmm. And they were there to vote on legalization of marijuana. So they would look at the other um, ballots. So, you know, there's just a lot of different aspects and, and makes it very complicated. But I think for women, we have to first, as in business, we have to first start um, supporting other women, right? We need to promote women, the pipeline, you were saying about getting people in the pipeline. Yeah. But also role modeling, we can't be what we can't see. You know, I have a 14 year old son and I really try as from the time he was a baby to make sure that he understood that women are just as powerful as just capable, that mom is a mom, but I'm also a businesswoman. I'm also a, a friend and I have other roles that define me besides being a mom. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are really important so that I think this generation, I see a lot of hope because he'll sometimes correct my husband on pronouns. <laughs> and, and, and when you say CEO or president, you're always using he, my, you know, what about a she? And that this show had a female protagonist. I mean, the last Star Wars movie with Ray Skywalker, you know, I mean, badass girls, right? And so, mm -hmm. so it's happening, but that kind of, um, of, of social conditioning takes generations. And I'm hoping this next yes. generation is really gonna see a difference in the shift about women. And they're seeing what six weeks women um, running for president, so it shouldn't be something that's, uh, you know, abnormal in the future. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping as well, is that it was, um, there were so many women running, and look at, look at how it, uh, um, 
look how many there were. I mean, that was the, those early debates were just amazing, you know, to see it was like, wow, this is what we've dreamed of, you know, for, for so long. And there they all are. And then to see them gradually drop out and, and honestly to, to unify, have to unify behind, there goes the kitty, have to unify behind uh, Joe Biden. You know, and and now I think what we need to be doing is hoping to God that he picks the right running mate, you know, that that he's listening, that he's got his pulse on what was going on and that he picks the right person and is as his running mate. And he's committed to it being a woman. You know, let's keep our fingers crossed and hope that nothing changes with that. But, you know, it it is. Um, I guess it's a little disheartening sometimes to say we came this close and we ended up with the same old, same old. That's mm -hmm. disheartening to me. Mm -hmm. So I think who he picks as, as his running mate is going to be really critical in showing um, a recognition of people's worth and, and a, a recognition of what a woman can bring to the ticket, hopefully not just as a political choice that I need to check these three boxes and that's who I'm going to pick but that there's truly some mindfulness into this is how this person compliments me and is going to serve our nation in the best possible way. Yeah. Well, Patty, you know, like you, I have a dream as well. Um, I'd like to see a lot of things change, but I think I, I honestly believe that a woman in our current structure can win uh, the presidential seat. Um, I think that if they, if that person emerges and they're, um, you know, they posture themselves correctly and they really go after the issues that resonate with people, people are so desperate right now for things and be related to them. Um, yes. And they just don't feel like they can relate to a lot of what other people are saying in terms of the, the candidates that are forward. They are, they are hungry for it. And I think if a woman shows up and start speaking to those issues, I definitely think she'll win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, like like Layla was sharing with us before she had to jump. Um, for those of you who don't know, she's running for for Congress, City Council in Carlsbad. City Council in Carlsbad. Okay, she's a, she's a businesswoman. Um, that's her. That's her. Um, her training, and so she has a very incredible pedigree as a businesswoman. Mm -hmm. So she's, you know, everyone keep your fingers crossed, hope for her, you know, phone bank for her if you want to. <laughs> but um, uh, some of what she said is so, so true. When you start thinking about um, the foundation of things, you know, I, I love American history and you, you research back to why certain things were put into place and what was the reasoning behind it. It makes it makes sense and you think about it, um, okay, I understand why certain things were put in into place. I honestly don't understand the electoral college. Um, I, you know, and you try to put yourself into their mindset back when the world was much, much smaller and what were they trying to prevent? But, you know, it does not seem right that the popular vote, the will of the people, the vote of the people is overridden by political action committees and uh, the numbers and jury or uh, uh, what's, what am I looking for? The, the jurisdictions, jurisdictions, a gerrymandering that goes um, on, you know, of, of changing yes. those, those jurisdictions and so forth. So uh, those are all foundational things that have got to be dealt with. You know, we, we hear about finance reform and all of that. And I believe we're seeing more and more of that come up because people are realizing it's not a level field level playing field when we're talking about money and stuff but there's so much that needs to be um that needs to be addressed you know that that keeps things uneven and, and even not just necessarily for women but just for um you know just in the political arena period you know he who has the gold makes the rules that's not right that's not american or it shouldn't be <laughs> i think it's it's interesting, and, I, and the, the money that you just mentioned, Patty, and Leela mentioned it as well, is the early fundraising and how pivotal that is and how people see that as to whether or not you're a viable candidate. Um, 
have you guys ever heard of Emily's List? Yeah. Um, so it's an organization that um, campaigns for uh, or raises money for female candidates mm -hmm. across the country. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know, and my husband was the one that had to tell me, is that it's, what it stands for is early money is like yeast. So that it's going to ferment and it's going to grow, right? It's going to rise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, which I thought was really interesting. And of yeah. course, I think in the, in the current crisis, since people are doing some isolation baking, I think the fact that he said that that's what it stood for was even more uh, interesting. But that is so pivotal. And because it is seen as if you're viable, mm -hmm. aside from, and there are so many of these factors, and of course it's just one, but I thought this is amazing that there's this, organization that that's all they're there for and it is to get money in there early get their names out there get them seen get them heard so that they can get that support and be really seen as viable so i told leela about it I'm like maybe they can help you <laughs> because it is across the board um and that's important I feel for changing the law that you know everybody gets a certain amount of money i mean it's in so many other yeah. countries I mean, why yeah. not? I don't think our founding fathers thought we would be able to buy the presidency. Yeah. Oh, and, and it just really reinforces that it's an old boys club. If it, that's all it comes down, not that's all it comes down, that, that's a factor of having success is how many, um, how many kickbacks are you getting from your, you know, the tribe that you've developed over your life. That's, I mean, it's just going to be more and more same old, same old. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like that's why we don't see um, people of color running very often. I mean, we, we certainly did um, in this race and we even had an openly gay man, which was shocking that he made it as far as he did. Um, but, you know, I think for the most part, the candidates kind of look the same, you know? <laughs> so it's, it would be really interesting to have more diversity. And that's that's why I, it's tentative for me to say, okay, well, I just want um, to put my support behind a woman. I really truly just want somebody that I, I um, trust and I feel will do the right thing, no matter like who they go to bed with at night or no matter what parts they're born with, that doesn't matter to me. So I almost feel like it's, are we doing a service or disservice by talking about um, is a female ready for president? And of course, I'm very excited about this conversation, but are we doing a disservice by just calling out the gender so much and really taking the even playing field and making it more, um, you know, more different, if you will, for lack of a better language. But yeah, it's that, that but I'm, I like the Emily's fund. Is Emily, what's it called? Emily's fund? Yeah. Called Emily's List. Emily's List. Um, yeah. Let me see. Yeah, it hit because then that's, I think that, yeah, it's a, that's a huge hurdle. Like if you didn't go to an Ivy League or if you didn't sit on the boards of the prestigious companies, then you don't have that financial backing that you need to really rise in the ranks. Yeah. Or you didn't have the tremendous financial and business success that our current president has had. Right. Well, his success <laughs> is debatable. Um, I, I said that with a joke. Okay, got you, got you. I also think that's why like Barack Obama's campaign was so amazing. Yeah. Came out of nowhere. He didn't really have backing. He'd barely even been a senator, right? Yeah. He had all of this grassroots funding. So he had small amounts that added up. Mm -hmm. And I just think that was so exciting. And people were excited about him. Like you were saying, Patty, they were passionate about their candidate and they showed up to the polls. Yeah. I've never attended an election night party and I did for Obama. Obama. Um, I went to a party where we were like watching the election results and I've never done that before, but something about his campaign just fired me up. And I definitely feel like it was very common. Everybody that I knew was really fired up for him too. I think that people felt like, wow, we have, we have crossed a, a threshold that, that we can elect a black man president. I think that's what was so exciting about it. And, and I'm going to make a confession to you guys, because when, when Barack first started running, I felt like, who the heck, who, who is, who is this guy? Where did he come from? He was a junior senator from Illinois. You know, and he 
he gave the speech at the Democratic National Convention and suddenly everybody can't stop talking about him and he's so wonderful and, and you know, obviously he's a skilled orator and so forth. But I, here's what my, it, the unease that came up in me, and this is from years of institutionalized politics, you know, because I'm pretty old, but it was like, where did he come from? I feel like I'm being manipulated. Mm -hmm. Is this the Manchurian candidate? Is something behind this that I don't understand? And I felt really uneasy about it. Mm -hmm. So where one side of me was saying, wow, look what we've done. The other side was saying, whoa, I don't get it. Where did this, this is not the way somebody rises in politics. Mm -hmm. So thinking, you know, we should have heard about him for 20 years. Now suddenly here he is running for president, just like it always is. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like that. So there was a distrust. Maybe that's what happens when you look at a stage of people running for office and there's, you know, a, a bunch of women in the middle of all of your normal dudes that you're expecting to see. Maybe that's what rises up in people that they start feeling threatened and they feel like this isn't, not that I felt threatened by him, but, but this isn't the way it's supposed to be. You know, the, we've got an order to things, you know, for God's sake, and we can't, we can't disrupt that. Hmm. You know, I just want to say, I think that this is, um, it's going to take a lifetime to change this. And I definitely think that we are ready, or let me, let me put it this way. I think a lot of us are ready. And I think the truth of the matter is, is that there is a large majority of our country who is not ready. Um, they're not enlightened. Uh, they're not self-actualized. Um, they are affected by um, reality celebrity. Um, and I think to what Adrian was saying about, you know, this, this religious slant, I think that there is a generation of women who have raised, unfortunately, younger generations of women who have been taught to acquiesce to men, um, that women need to know their place. And um, that Donald Trump's foibles, like grabbing a woman's pussy, and it's like, this is just thing that men say, and they don't really mean it. And um, there's these gigantic blind spots. And if we think about it really truthfully, uh, the civil rights movement was not that long ago. Yeah. Um, we, we have this glaring defect of ignorance and bigotry and racism that is part of our history. Um, and it's embarrassing that our parents um, lived through that, that it was not that long ago. And not long before that, women couldn't vote. So we have a long way to go. And I feel like until women truly start supporting other women and start having deep, genuine conversations and really listen to one another and stop judging and stop shaming and can find a place of understanding, um, we have a long road ahead of us. And um, when Marianne was running for Congress, which happened before she was running for president, I was at the event when she announced that she was running for the 33rd district, which I do not live in, but I canvassed for her, I campaigned for her, um, I gave money, and I knew what a long shot it was, but I was so captivated by her commitment and her devotion to change the conversation, to bring a feminine quality of this conversation into Congress. Um, and we all knew it was a long shot and I knew that her running for president would be a long shot, um, but I gave to her campaign and I, because I wanted to stimulate the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then for me, it was a matter of either Pete Buttigieg or Bernie. And I really liked a lot of the women on um, that were running, but they didn't speak to me. And I am an absolute feminist. Um, 
but I cannot vote for a woman just because a woman is running. Mm -hmm. And with Hillary, um, I voted for Hillary. I chose Hillary, but prior to that, I was a Bernie girl. You know, I was in Sarah Silverman's camp and I have some friends who are very close with Hillary and Hillary's family. And um, they were campaigning for her. They've been campaigning with Hillary for years. Um, and they were mortified that I wasn't on the Hillary train, but I will tell you when she won the nomination, um, you better believe it. Like I wasn't, I'm, I'm not an asshole and I wasn't out to get Hillary. It's just that for me, my leanings and my preference was with Bernie and what he was talking about. Um, and I was actually supposed to be in New York the night that we thought Hillary was going to win, um, except my anniversary is November 9th. And so I had a decision to make, like go hang out with my like celebrity girlfriends and Jay-Z and Beyonce and all these people that were gonna be partying with Hillary because of course she was gonna win. Or was I gonna go to Disneyland the next day with my husband for our anniversary? Um, so I chose to be with my husband, but that night watching the results come in, was so devastating and it was such a shock to the system but i think that it just told us how far we still have to go that we live in a divided country that there are still people who don't think that a black man should be president and if and if we look at the if we look at what barack obama went through as president in fact just this week when um when barack finally spoke up and fucking Mitch McConnell, <clears throat> when they were asking him for his opinion, he's like, uh, I think he should just keep his mouth shut. I'm like, you know, like, <clears throat> when... As if, as if Mitch McConnell keeps his mouth shut ever. Yeah, I'm <laughs> exactly. all for that. Yeah. Exactly. But, but, the, but, like, what happened to this decorum about, like, respecting the office of the presidency? And, and when it came to Barack Obama that was out the window. Um, and the fact that they just, they resisted him at every turn. And, and yet the stuff that, that Donald Trump gets away with, like we've, I feel like we've gone backwards a little bit. And, I, and I'll tell you one more thing. I was back in Nebraska where my sister lives uh, after Barack got nominated. And my sister owned this little retail candle store. And she had this little 12 year old boy who was her intern and he was very buttoned up and he, he looked like, a, like if his name would have been Poindexter, it would not have surprised me. So I get to the candle store, my sister's late as always, and he's got his little bow tie on and his button up shirt and his little like um, Mr. Rogers cardigan. And he's like, where's your sister? She's late. She needs to be on time. We need to open the store on time. So I felt uh, energetically like this, sweet, adorable 12 year old who loved candles and loved lace and loved material. I just had a suspicion that his leanings might be that he was going to grow up and not necessarily be a straight man. I can't make that decision for him, but just that is certainly what he conveyed. He was uh, very flamboyant and adorable. And uh, so we started talking and he wanted to talk about the election. And he's like, so who did you vote for in his little accent? And I said, I voted for Barack. And he's like, oh, so your man won. And I said, my man did one and I couldn't be happier. And he said, my parents were really happy that Barack Obama won too. And I was like, oh, bless his heart. Like he's got liberal parents. He's gonna be fine. He's gonna come out when he's 16 and like, it's all gonna be good. Like, oh, I was and he's like, in Nebraska. Yes, but I was like, but at, but at least his parents like, they're gonna to be totally cool with this. And I said, oh, I said, so did your parents vote for Obama? He's like, oh, heavens no. He said, um, they're happy that he got a nominated because now he can be assassinated. <gasps> and needless to say, I ended up having a very uh, schooling kind of conversation with him um, and, and really had to like manage my tone and really kind of start to unpack and help him unearth his own opinion and uh, why that was so atrocious. And I mean, whether or not he remembered that or it made any dent at all, but the point is, is that this is part of the problem, that there are 
grandparents and then parents and then their kids and then their kids ki like that are being indoctrinated um, of this old history and this old lineage that just is so archaic and so heinous and heartbreaking. And so I love today's topic. I definitely think that we are ready for a woman president and I will canvass and I will fight for women's rights to be a president and to, to make their own choices about their bodies. And I'm also not gonna be naive about the fact that we have a very, very long way to go and a lot of work to do. Well, I think I like what you said about um, <clears throat> generationally, you know, these are things that the things our parents said, the things that our grandparents said, these things are passed down to us somewhere. You got to stop that. You know, I remember yes. that um, my parents were uh, World War II. You know, my dad served in World War II. That's when they got married. My mom lost two brothers in World War II. Very very red leaning in high school. You know, I, I started finding my own way. I was too young to vote for Bobby Kennedy, but I worked for Bobby Kennedy's campaign was devastated when he was killed. And, you know, and, and there was this huge rift between us, but there was such a difference in at that time, what was going on in politics between what Bobby Kennedy stood for, what Martin Luther King stood for, and then what, what was on this other side, you know, with, you know, starting with Johnson and Nixon and so forth. And um, so there was this rift, you know, and, and I, I think that at least in my personal experience, the fact I had such a rift with my parents in those days um, led me to sort of raise my kids to be like, you need to figure it out. You know, it's not just what I think, it's you need to figure it out and you need to believe in something enough, you know, that you would be willing to die for it. Believe for something enough that you'd be willing to, for God's sake, phone bank for it at least, you know, do something, write letters, do something and believe in it, What, regardless of what it is, but believe enough and, and break some of this generational uh, institution of what our belief system is. I, you know, we were talking, Diana, you had mentioned about, um, from the, the Christian perspective, uh, my niece is, is a pastor's wife. And just the, the most, she is my hero. She is the most genuine, good person in the world. And she homeschooled all of her kids. She has five boys, homeschooled them all. And she said, um, you know, I, a, a big part of their civics education is watching the news, watching the debates, watching the this, watching the that. And she said, I could not let my sons watch the debates. I could not let them, when Hillary and, and Trump were running, I could not let them watch that. I could not let them research in, and learn anything about this man. How could I teach my sons that this is decent behavior, this is what, this is the way we treat women. She goes, I'm not teaching my sons that. And I was like, yes, it's that, that conscience that begins to sink into, like I said earlier, what do I believe in? What do I want to be known for? What do I want my kids to say about me? I, I really and truly don't understand how people put that on the fucking shelf mm -hmm. for a Supreme Court pick. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you because, do that? Because their beliefs are it. Like, mm -hmm. the number one thing is abortion. Mm -hmm. The Catholics, the Christians, the, I mean, you name it, it's the same thing. I work with, I work in bridal. So I have so many um, different religions that I work with, and all of them are the same thing. It's about the abortion. Mm -hmm. That's it. So it doesn't matter how disgusting he is as long as their agenda is being passed it doesn't matter and honestly i never knew that i was related to so many of these people um it's a I, shock <laughs> the la yeah the last time i went to church and my husband can like attest to this my nephew was doing his first communion and all of us were at church and we're all there behind him you know like whatever and the priest said, 
uh, let's talk about women's rights. Women do not need rights. He said this in a packed church. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, seriously said it to my husband. And my niece, who is a lesbian, was like, Mm -hmm. all, and I was like, I'm going to walk out of this church right now. Like, I should just get up and be like, let's talk about priests touching little boys. Mm -hmm. You know, like that. And my husband was like, calm down, like, calm down. This is like Isaac's special thing. But you know what? When we get home, my brother-in-law, who is kind of a pain in the ass, is like the number one guy who's like, you do not treat women like this. You speak up. You do not make women uncomfortable. Like, this guy is like kind of all right when it comes to that stuff. So I'm just like, okay, at least my nephews are okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, I'm the aunt. So I'm constantly cursing and constantly being like, you do not do this to women. This is not okay. You know, and they're just like, we know, we know. You've been saying it since we were five. You know, like, that type of thing. But for saying it we need that to be heard so you know we talk about incremental change and yeah it's everywhere it's everywhere challenging those norms it's so it's, good for it's you really rough because i am american born uh, you know whatever but my entire family is mexican we've got mexican filipino chinese black and the majority of them are still old school and it's it, I'm constantly fighting with my mom who is a Catholic and you know and I finally got her to realize the other day about abortion we took a drive and I was like hey mom if you don't want one don't get one like that's it it's that easy but don't take away that option for other women like it's not up to you not everyone is religious and she was like no you're actually totally right hmm and yeah, and you know, what I'm realizing through this conversation we have is what we have right here is an echo chamber. And we are all coming at this conversation from a very similar viewpoint. But what I think we're missing is calm, collected, uh, you know, non emotional conversations with people and just coming at it with curiosity. Because I would love to have conversations with people that aren't in my echo chamber. And I would love to just ask, well, why do you think like that? And, and what does that mean to you? And I think there's just so much um, trying to shove your agenda down other people's throats that um, either you, you end up with people that you know agree with you and just, you know, hating on the people that don't. But I think there's a lot to be learned. Um, And I think that's, uh, you know, it probably took you a long time to have that conversation with your mom, Diana. And, and, and I just, it it just, it's so unfortunate that that's that issue that, um, and Patty, you touched on this really well. That issue of abortion just takes everything else out of the equation. And so it's just so frustrating. And I think more of us should just have conversations that come from a place of curiosity and truly not trying to put your agenda on someone else, but being curious and being open to learning. And I think that's missing. Yeah. I think one of the, sorry, (laughs) one of the comments I would like to kind of throw in, I actually was a candidate um, in a county commissioner race And I can tell you, I believe from that experience that every single person should run for office once. You know, somebody mentioned that women tend to run because they want to make a difference. I can definitely relate to that. Um, It wasn't my goal to become an elected official. Um, I ended up uh, meeting with my my, uh, primary competitor and agreeing that I that she had a better chance, probably than I did. And so we agreed. And it was something that political candidates just never did. But we did it because we were women who wanted the best for our particular district. And we waited until we had beat out the one man who had also thrown his hat into the ring that both of us agreed could not win that race because he would not be good for the district. Yeah. So that's incredible, Belinda. I can't imagine. That's incredible. And, And we did it very purposely. In fact, we talked, she said to me, you know, my political strategist said, absolutely do not meet with her. She is your 
she's your adversary. <laughs> and she said, you know what? I decided to meet with you anyway. We sat down over lunch. We talked about our different positions. We are very much the same on paper. We look the same, but we strategized. And this guy, we both agreed, could not win. And we decided that we would both stay in and make sure that he did not win, you know, by talking about the issues, by positioning ourselves. And he did not. He, he, did, he came in third. I came in really neck and neck with her. And then so that she could then focus on the, there was a lot of needs in the community at that point in time. It was undergoing a lot of change in our particular district so that she could focus on the transition. I then yeah. backed out of the race. So she didn't have to worry about fighting me in the election. And it was, it was a great experience, but I will tell you, anyone who has ever run for any office will tell you, if you think you have a thick skin, you don't know what a thick skin is until you've run for office. And I believe everyone should run for office at least once. Yeah. <laughs> wow. You know, and I, I, in thinking about, and we're past the time, so I'm happy to keep talking for a few minutes if you guys are as well, because um, we'll, we'll just take this on for just a little bit longer. Um, some May of I ask a question? Yeah, dear. Yeah. Um, well, as I'm gathering from everybody I've heard speak so far, everybody seems to be left leaning on this discussion. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, if I've got that right, but um, is it, would you, would you vote for um, a female Republican? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would. So, I mean, I is that, but does that devalue? I probably wouldn't. Is, is that, is that devaluing then women just saying, you know, uh, that's a good question. You know, it's it almost like, you know, it's, it's just, yeah. yeah, it's just becomes lumps everybody together and, you know, I, like and I think I think it's like it was being said earlier until we can do away with this party system and I mean because if we think back and it it wasn't in my lifetime that I remember but that the Republicans actually used to be the more liberal mm -hmm. right so like I don't I don't know when all of this started changing and the when we went off the silver standard and the gold standard and the money got all fucked up and you know I think when money became the god and when money became the goal and the objective which is why there's so much hype right now i think about like get america back to work again no matter what um like i think our just our priorities are problematic in in regards to our government and so i think for me personally as long as there is this party standard um if a female represented at the moment what republicans seem to be representing in our current setting I wouldn't have any part of it. Like I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole, mm -hmm. not on my life. Mm -hmm. Like I would. That, and that's, that's an excellent, that is absolutely excellent because I have, I'm, I'm 66. So I'm older than all of you guys, probably all of you guys put together. I have voted both sides of the party my entire life. It was only recently. And I would say, you know, the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years that I said, I can't be aligned with this anymore. I just, I just can't. And so it would have to be a hell of a Republican woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she would have to represent everything different. And the fact that everything is so stacked, you know, from the, you know, the Congress to the Senate to the, you know, who's, who's, you know, getting all the votes to be on the court and so forth, that it makes it really hard to break out of that two party system. But, um, it would be great if you could say I'm voting for the right person, but unfortunately right now we're voting for an institution that has to be broken down. And I, I kind of wanted to go back to something Marcy said about us being in an echo chamber. And I think this is kind of where you were going, Susan, is that yeah. um, even though maybe we all have some similar leanings at this point, I think there's a lot of diversity in thinking and maybe uh, gradient in, in thinking uh, along certain things here because um, I, I am a Christian. I am a strong Christian. I have 
come into strong disagreements with many of my Christian friends over political beliefs and so forth. And the, the current administration has probably been the most divisive and most horrible time that I've ever been through with some of my faith-based friends. Um, I do think there is a place for um, being faith-based and you still have a freaking brain. You know, I believe that you can be um, anti-abortion and pro-life. I think that there's a whole lot of areas in there where you, you don't have to be black and white. You don't have to say, I'm going to sacrifice everything I believe is good and right and holy just so I can stack that freaking court and make sure that Roe v. Wade gets overturned. That is just so wrong, you know, in the grand scheme of things. What are you giving up? for that. I have been more libertarian in those kinds of, of views than anything else. That's probably driven more as I don't want the government in my womb. I don't want the government in my bedroom. I don't want the government in any of my personal business at all. That is none of their business. And I don't personally want to know what you think about it. It just shouldn't be that way. And yet here we are, you know, here we are. I, I agree. I have actually voted on both sides um, all the time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, I was actually the campaign strategist for um, a, a guy who was running for an office. And it was interesting because at the time I was registered as a Democrat in a different state than what he was running in. And so first of all, and he was also a Republican. And it didn't matter to him that I was a Democrat and that I was going to be his campaign strategist. He was the right candidate. And that's why I was behind him. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, I have been both Democrat and Republican because I am in the middle and I vote for the right person from my perspective. But anyway, I went to campaign strategy school because candidates go to these things to learn how to campaign and learn the rules and all of these things that I went. And I felt so threatened because there were some people who, who started to talk to me. And first of all, I was from the wrong state and that was already a problem. And then they started asking me some questions and I would, I would not tell them I was a Democrat because I thought my head will be on a stake outside of this building if they find out I'm a Democrat from mm -hmm. at the time Oregon. But you know, I think that's what tolerance is about. We have to be able to start having conversations where we can understand why somebody thinks the way they do instead of automatically attack them for what they might think. Because I think when you get down to it, we all want very similar things. Mm -hmm. You know, I was gonna share with you girls, Marianne um, started um, a women's organization before she ran for Congress, and it was called Sister Giant. And really, her advocacy was for more women in politics. And I don't, I don't believe that she ran for Congress or for president thinking that she wouldn't win. But I do believe that she ran because she is devoted to women having a voice in politics. Um, and so I included a couple of links um, in, the, in the chat, just what she's doing now politically to really continue to charge up this conversation. And she wrote a book in 2019 called A Politics of Love. Mm -hmm. um, so just if, if you're interested at all, I just, I wanted to just, um, I just wanted to share that with you. I'll share this chat with all of you as well. Oh, thank There's you. There's a lot thank of you. stuff in there. And I just wanted to point out that behind me right here, if you can see the, the picture that starts its gold at the top and at the bottom, yes. that is one of Marianne's poems. And it's, oh. my, it's, it's the one everybody knows, you know, who are you not to be? And a friend of mine painted that for me. So, mm. wow. Oh, that's so beautiful. How apropos, Patty. I know. Yeah. So. Well, you guys, this has been an amazing conversation. It's been everything I had hoped that it would be. And I hope it has been for you guys as well. Um, and we need to continue this conversation. I think there is so much work to be done. I think you're right. This is a generational thing. It takes a long time to change. And unfortunately, in America, sometimes it seems like we make fits and starts. We take a few steps forward, then we take a few steps back. 
you know, and, and under, under certain, under the current administration, you know, before it or against it, what have you, I believe we've taken some major steps backward. Um, and, and we just need to be, we need to believe what we believe. We need to fight for what we believe. We need to stand for what we believe. You know, I, for one, I'm, I'm phone banking and emailing and so forth, trying to get the vote out because we got to get these millennials off their ass and make them vote because it's, something's got to change, right? <laughs> Any Absolutely. last comments from anybody? I'm, I'm loving yeah. to hear you. Patty, I'll be super quick. I also wanted to let everyone know, and I know you're going to send the chat out. Um, the podcast that I included, I just recently listened to it. And since we were talking about like the, the, the unlikelihood of people changing, um, Megan Phelps uh, Roper, whose grandfather started uh, the Westboro Baptist Church. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know, the Westboro Baptist Church is the one that um, they would pick at funerals. Um, they, they said that the kids at Newton, um, the shooting in Connecticut. Um, yeah, that didn't spoil. There, was there's that, just no happy. end to yeah. the horribleness of what, Yeah, of what they do. And, um, you know, that those babies or, you know, anybody dying of AIDS and, uh, but she had an epiphany. Um, and it was through, and she talks about why she left the church and, and how she um, how she was able to break this cycle and it was through and somebody earlier mentioned I, I think um, Marcy I think it might have been you but somebody had a conversation with her on Twitter that was an actual conversation um, and she met her with empathy and and had completely opposing views of her but actually engaged her in a conversation and she began to feel things that had been completely stuffed down um, that she wouldn't dare give her per herself permission to feel and it just gave me so much hope and so in the midst of like this conversation when I'm like you know we have a long way to go and I believe that we do but there is there are those moments and there are ways that we can make a difference and and people we we can get through you know my dad's dad my grandfather was a card carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan and my dad completely rejected that notion and my dad was the only boy he had seven sisters um, and wanted nothing more than his dad's approval but he was so morally uh, he so morally objected to this idea and, you know, by the grace of everything holy, he escaped that history. But like, this is, this is the reality of what people are up against. So anyway, I just wanted to share that that's what was, that that what was in the chat. And if you girls want to be part of the book club that, that Adrian and I were talking about, Unplugging the Patriarchy, uh, if Patty, if it's okay to give me everybody's email address, or I'll send it to you, Patty, and you can send it out. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, like I didn't okay. put my email in the chat, but I would, I definitely want to um, yeah. be engaged in this discussion. Yeah, Wonderful. I'll share this chat with all of you. And, and, you know, I think that to the point about Megan from the Westboro Baptist Church, I think we don't ever change anybody's mind by screaming at them by yelling at them, by fighting on Twitter or, or Instagram and, and the, the horrible things that happen. You, you change people's minds by meeting them where they are. You change them with love. I just believe that wholeheartedly. So I do too. thanks Thank you guys for being a part of this. Thank it's you. been a wonderful Thank time. You. Thank and you. I will be in touch. Thanks for being my friends tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Patty. Bye, Bye girls. Bye. Thanks Bye. to the panel too. Bye, everyone. Bye. It was a great panel. Thank you.